morning. And well, I know some of you are on the East Coast, so if it's lunchtime, hope you're able to get a little bite in during this call. It's just wonderful to see all of you. Um, I want to thank Kelly and and the headquarters to just make this possible. And I was able to join our program directors at a meeting yesterday, and I said, this is kind of a warts and all presentation. So I'm excited to be invited to speak first, but that does not mean anything about how, where we are in this process. We have far to go, and we're learning as we go. So I think at really making time for questions and conversations at the end of this is our goal. So I'm going to open up my deck, but go kind of quickly. I just threw a lot together that, that might be just kind of conversation starters. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Can you see my slides? Wonderful. Yes. Okay. So we'll just kind of jump in. I, I have this organized in a way that will kind of go over some of our early advances and then into the Cancer Equity and Diversity Committee that we have purposely named, which I'll, I'll tell you about. Uh, to Kelly talking about our heart partnerships and our heart initiative, and then what that impact on each of these things caused in terms of our policies, procedures, strategic planning, also the, our health equity efforts and engagement with the greater community. So in terms of our early efforts, I've been with the organization coming on seven years. Julia Forth is our executive director, our CEO, and she's been in this role for close to 10 with the organization for 25, celebrating her anniversary last year. So over the course of the time that we've been together, I think there's been a lot of change in initiative, including trainings for all staff including uh, some changes that we have even at the entrance of our building. Although we're not there right now, we in introduced a flag that it was a pride flag that had a CSCLA logo. Uh, we received some incredible feedback about the impact that made of just the comfort of, of the LGBTQ community accessing our services. And we're hopeful to also put that into our digital format. Uh, we've done a lot of expansion with satellite programming so if you've been to L.A. and some of you may have had training there, uh, we are nestled in the West L.A., but our service territory kind of crosses the Los Angeles area. So we wanted to be inclusive in mind of we're not going to ask everybody to get to where we are. We need to find ways to get to you. So that was one of our early initiatives. And then just purposeful uh, planning to our staff that kind of match our demographics in LA because we also want to have providers that look like the communities that they're providing services to and incorporating individuals from those communities onto our staff. So uh, what, with those efforts to what we are right now, I just wanted to give a quick snapshot of what our, our team looks like. And then I threw on here the LA census. This is an estimate from the 2019 to 2021 uh, US census what the demographics look like in LA and comparative, comparatively to our staff. So we've made some advances. There's things that we can change. You will see that in terms of our male, female, we don't have a lot of men. And, and we, I think that is something that we're purposely looking for also. Uh, so I wanted to I'll make sure that I also included kind of gender identity in this as well. But we have also made advances so we can have programs within other languages and get to communities that might not have access. Uh, so we'll talk more about that as we get into this. Okay. So I said that we had purpose in the name. So the Cancer Equity and Diversity Committee, we started this in fall of 2020. We meet regularly, uh, uh, quarterly. And uh, we have individuals that are some on staff, the majority external to our community, our network partner. And, and uh, what I would say is you'll see that, or I showed you a moment ago, in LA, we're about 48% Hispanic Latinx with an expectation of going beyond 50% in the next 10 years. So we're really trying to incorporate that into our Cancer Equity and Diversity Committee. And so you will see here, the name came about very organically from the committee members. And uh, Cancer Equity and Diversity, if we, we call it our SED committee, com committee, in Spanish, SED means thirst. And this became a, a, a real goal of the whole committee to have this be a thirst for inclusion and knowledge and multi-directional communication. 
We're not trying to go in and provide something. We're, we're here to listen and recognize the strengths of the communities in which we work with. And that has been a, a true guiding force. I added a link here and I'll share these slides, but this is where you can find out more about uh, our committee at the cancersupportla.org website and the About Us drop down. Coming out of the committee, as well as just some of our efforts that I spoke about earlier, we recognized here, this is just an infographic to show where we're really kind of purposefully adding programs. So we can have these programs, not just across the five pillars of what CSC offers, but with regard to different communities. So we can have targeted programming available. So this is just a quick idea, and we're also including young adults, AYA in this initiative. How can we make sure that a uh, parent of a child recently diagnosed with cancer has support? How can we make sure that somebody that is in a community that does not have access to our main location, that we can create a satellite close to them so that there's something available? And then the opportunity that came out of the virtual programming has just been really huge to make sure that individuals have access without geography playing a factor, without uh, access to their, their medical care, without uh, individuals feeling like they are too sick to come to the community. So our virtual programming is in place now and will be almost exactly the same as we go back to the community in person and as we go back to our community partners to offer in-person services. So in terms of our HEART partnerships, the HEART is also it's healing equitably through action resilience and teamwork. And this came about through a grant application. We realized it, we just had not put a name to the efforts that we had in place. So in terms of how we think to kind of really collaborate with a greater community, that's how this HEART initiative came to be. And it's kind of a guiding force for a lot of what we do in terms of programming to make sure that there is uh, access to our services. And what that means is that we work with a lot of hospital systems, possibly just community organizations, other nonprofits that are like-minded, like missioned. This is a list of some of the partnerships that we have in place. So while it might not be a full embedded CSC in a hospital, it's how do we find ways to make sure that we are not kind of working in silos or both spinning our wheels. We really want to think collaboratively, and it's actually increased uh, the access that we've received from other organizations reaching out to us saying, you know what, well, our organization doesn't offer as many in-person services or virtual services. We would love to collaborate with you to make sure that there is a group available for our caregivers, and we can design something together. So it's listening to the needs and, and working uh, with other organizations and with the community. Another area that we put some purposeful, uh, it, this took a year, but we're purposely kind of getting engaged with uh, the Community Clinic Association of LA County. They go by CCALAC, and there are similar agencies across the country. So you can try to, to see what might be available near your network partner. And I'm trying to remember network partner instead of affiliate. So I'm now I'm going to stumble 10 more times. But um, what this is, it's an association of federally qualified health center representation. So we're able to uh, get into this committee. They meet monthly. Uh, Julia and I were both able to do talks at roundtables, one for behavioral health and one for health education, and that had leadership across the FQHQs in LA. And that was our in. We have now applied for membership status, which we're awaiting to hear back from so we can have this even more meaningful engagement through 2022 and hopefully beyond. And what we, we hope to get from this is that those that have uh, individuals that are managing a cancer diagnosis themselves or in their family know about CSC. We can find out how we can write collaborative grants to get programs into the FQHCs, and we can really find out what the needs are of the community. Health literacy is another component that we're, we're making some strides in, and this was through an introduction from a member of our uh, Cancer Equity and Diversity Committee saying, have you talked to the public library? And we had not, and it hadn't even really crossed our radar. And we got an introduction, had an incredible meeting, and found out that the public library system 
Uh, in LA, there's 72 libraries in the public library system, mind you. But the, the large one that's in downtown LA has a lot of programming for what they call learners. And a lot of these are individuals that may have English as a second language or non-primary English speakers and how they can get access to services and how they can uh, develop literacy. And what we see also is that there is a gap sometimes in how an individual that does not have English as a primary language is not able to get their questions answered, is not able to get full communication from their doctor appointments just because of a language barrier. So we're now looking to see how we can develop something maybe that is for individuals from this like kind of learner idea that we can be supportive and they can connect with each other uh, in, in potentially, uh, again, a non-English primary support service or a group, or uh, we've heard um, the idea of an immigrant group. We don't have a name yet. We're trying to really do some research to see what would be a good fit here. But how can we make a space for somebody uh, to, to find someone else who might have similar obstacles and communicate with, with each other surrounding those obstacles to, to find some normalization? and additional socialization to what they're going through. Uh, policies and procedure. Oh, and I see that Kelly is putting in our, uh, our links. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> There's more to come there. Okay, so policies and procedures. So what does this mean? Because sometimes it's like if we're just talking about it and we're not really putting any actionable steps together, it, we're not going forward, we're not making progress and that's what we're working on. So we just did our strategic plan at the end of 2021, that's going to be 2022 through 2024. And we embedded the work that we wanna do for justice, equity, diversity, inclusivity into our strategic plan. So that will also be embedded into our budget. And it, it, we're hopeful that this will, can help CSU Los Angeles to, to make some of these meaningful strides towards more inclusive programming. So this is just a, a, one of our goals. We had four large goals coming out of the strategic plan. One was the engaging communities. And we put the strategy that we really wanna have this framework across program as well as administration de development operations. So it's not just a, in one area, but it is in how we think it in, in terms of our programming and our partnership. Uh, this is a lot, and I don't think you'll be able to read it because I can barely read it on my screen right now, but I just wanted to give some example of what that means and how we're putting this into policy. So we've included language about our commitment to DEI into our welcome packet and also into our job descriptions. So it's just how we want to really start threading this through all that we do. And uh, again, I'll share these slides if you want to see this information. So health equity, uh, Kelly was able to share that we did have a summit. So this was in November. It was our inaugural health equity summit. And we're excited to have this be something that it is continuous. So we're looking forward to doing this uh, annually. We had some incredible presenters from across the country and a lot from our local LA area to really talk about what uh, health equity looks like in their, their specific uh, expertise and background and what they do professionally. So this is a list of our speakers. Um, again, hats off to headquarters. A couple of these actually came from a presenta presentation that HQ put on, and we were just blown away from the Natalie Burke's and Julia Applegate's presentation. So we really wanted to include them in this. But we had locally from City of Hope, Dr. Ashing. We had Dr. Hayes Batista from UCLA, who is incredible, and he is at the forefront of, of Latinx health. Um, Zul from C Cedar sinai and I, I was fortunate enough to be able to join in and just talk about CSCLA's efforts and collaboration and, and how that has an impact on our health equity. This is what we looked like on our round table. So we were able to not just do pre like individual presentations, but we had a round table discussion with some incredible questions that were posed to the whole group. And we were able to offer continued education credits for mental health professionals. Uh, our turnout looked like this. We were able to have uh, over 200 register, about 126 attended, uh, 28 from mental health professionals. So this is across disciplines of psychologists, uh, licensed mental, or licensed marriage and family therapists, licensed clinical social workers, I believe even LPCCs, if they were out of state, we don't have that as a, a license in California right now um, that we work with too much. 
but we were really able to offer it. And we'd love to see growth there too. How do we get uh, an application in to offer CME credit so medical providers can join? We want nurses to be able to join. So again, this was our first one. We learned a lot and we have a great growth trajectory <laughs> plan and, and uh, some hopeful expansion there. But we did have uh, roundtable discussion, presentations, and, and quite a, a lot of insightful content. Okay, this is this is hot off the press. So when we talk about collaboration, I've had the opportunity over the last two years to be on the Health Equity Committee of the American Psychological Association. And one of the first tasks that we had last year was uh, a organizational-wide at APA initiative for equity flattens the curve. And what we were able to produce out of the committee was this uh, assessment tip sheet. So uh, this is meant to be kind of a guide for individuals in mental health professionals and beyond, I really will say and beyond, uh, to just kind of take a look at our own policies, our procedures, our organization, our structure. If you're in private practice, what, you know, how do you access how, how accessible are you actually to, to the greater community? So it's really to kind of look inward and come up with some ideas to make improvements to offer more equitable services. And this, I don't know if this can be pulled. Oh, you got it already, Kelly? You're ahead of me. Okay. So this, um, this will take you to a website that is from the APA. Again, we're going to be doing a soft launch at the APA conference in August with a more meaningful, I think, event in October. But this is open, so I was very excited to share it. This just came out this month. Uh, so excited to share with all of you. I hope you're able to access this. There's also a PDF embedded in this website that you can pull out if you would like to take a look at it and see how it can uh, support your own uh, affiliate. And uh, this is the same thing that we're gonna be doing at our, our affiliate in LA. So uh, what it kind of has embedded in it is just looking at social determinants of health and uh, looking at it a little bit from a population or pub public health standpoint. Uh, these are some of the ideas and questions and topics that are offered for consideration of how are staff educated, what types of services are provided, is it accessible, even to the point of hours of operation, you know, is there, is, are, are your services Fitting the needs, are they are the gaps um, taken into consideration when anything is created uh, to, to offer programming? And then this is just kind of a quick overview of planning the seed to commit and reflecting as an organization, engaging with stakeholders and communities, putting a plan for change on paper, and monitoring progress. Uh, the flexibility piece is huge. We know that this is a work in progress. And there, I think there's fluidity in these steps a little bit where we kind of go forward and kind of kind of come a little bit back. I would say that plan on paper, that's where we considered this needs to be on our strategic plan. We need to make sure that we recognize that our goal is across all of our program development operations. So that's available to each of you. And then in terms of community engagement, uh, Partnership. I, I, I was just on a, a, a different meeting and I talked about just the, I think the gratitude that I have for how connected we are for me as a program director to be able to have regular meetings with all of the program directors across the country and, and beyond. Um, it is incredible because it's multi-directional, like sharing of information, knowledge and learning. So we, we don't have to do it alone. We are able to coordinate and, and uh, work together, learn from each other. Where I have a struggle, someone else will have a, a potential solution, or we can at least talk it out. So using that same idea in the communities in which we provide our services, it's working with the community, not having any idea of what we need to do, but what do we need to do to modify our programming? What are the needs of the community? Because it's not cookie cutter. And so these are just invitations that we have openly of how we like to engage with uh, others in, in the community, other organizations, other, uh, like the FQHCs, how we can invite that conversation. So again, it's across disciplines. It's not, um, I think multidisciplinary, it comes really naturally to CSD and Gilda's Club, which I think we should be proud of 
because we don't have just one mental health profession. We have a slew of mental health professionals. We have a slew of other engagements and, and backgrounds. But how do we also look to our hospital partners to, to really work with them? So again, across disciplines, across departments, um, multi-institution, grants can be available, research projects can be available, and it's thinking about how we work together and how we think outside of the box. And I just added like minutes before uh, this talk, local community advisory boards. So as you start getting your footing in this, you'll be able to see that, you know, for us, we're on the City of Hope Community Advisory Board. We are on the, the Cedar sinai Advisory Board, and we have representation from both, both of those hospitals and those systems on our uh, said committee. So again, it's working together because we can learn from each other. It's also the value that you bring as a representative of CSC into these other systems. So not to forget that piece. Uh, thinking collaboratively, we are unique in Southern California because there are four CSCs very, very close to one another. We can drive to one another uh, in a day, it might take a whole day. There's traffic to get to all of us, but uh, geographically we're very close. So how do we work collaboratively? And this is something that's been kind of a blooming collaboration considering us CSC SoCal, because in our territory, our hospital system, there's such a burst of community clinics and, and um, satellite sites that traverse all of our territories. So being able to be there for the hospital systems, we have to think differently. And so I'm, I've always been excited since the day that I started with CSC, I've had close contact with the program directors of each of these affiliates. But now it's like, how can we all together think about how we can provide more meaningful services to, to the Southern California area and making it as seamless as possible for a referral to get to, to, to our actual services. So that's also in thinking collaboratively. So I think I'm ending, but I'm ending with this. So it's just the idea of evolution and thinking about community partnerships. And this is really looking at it a lens, at a lens of, of health and racial equity to collaboratively engage with the communities uh, that we serve to revolutionize supportive care. We have a lot of opportunity. And again, in LA, we are learning and growing daily. And there's things that I know that I've probably even said today that next week or next year, or next month, I'll think, you know that I would shift how I talk about that, or I would shift how I think about that. But only speaking that because I know that I've shifted so many times as I've learned along the way, but I'm starting the conversation. And again, this is just to kind of offer what we've done and how we've started to think about it. And I think the value that we have is that we can also hear from each of you. And that's why having this task force created that Kelly talked about and having this meeting is really to hear each other and not just talk. So I went rapidly. Thank you.